Professor Kerr, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it was, uh, the Kerrs lived one next door but one from us, and uh, my brother, my late brother Vince, uh, was the same age as um, Alec, and they were great mates uh, before the war. Alec uh, had the world's greatest father, and uh, I tell you this because during the war when everyone was away, my dad was away and everything, I spent a lot of time at the back of the Kerrs, and his father was an engineer and had a, an oil re-refining, we call it, business, and he used to rebuild engines. And um, uh, amongst other things, I mention that because uh, later on I had a, a mining partner, Arthur Wichlow Nichols, that some of you would have known as Wing Commander Nichols, who flew in Europe and then was blown out of a window in the first raid in Japan, they're not liberators, but he was the salesman for, for Kurs before the war. He was saved from it by the war, he said. Uh, the Kurs also were unique in that the, the, they flew. Everyone in the district knew that Langford uh, used to fly aeroplanes at Subiaco Aerodrome. And I remember when, as kids, my brother and I walked from West Leadable, where we were, Northwood Street, over to the Subiaco Aerodrome and peered into the hangars there hoping to see a Clem. At those days, I only knew two aeroplanes, I only ever saw two aeroplanes, the DC-2, the Bungana, and the Clems. And, and there weren't any there, but there was an Ortegaro in the shed. And years later in Sydney, I came across the fellow who's, who owns the Ortegaro, and they've, they're rebuilding it over there. Now, Itashagan used to fly these Clems, and some of you will know about the Clems, the Clem's landing speed was so low that if there was any wind, you landed backwards. And it was pretty exciting. And we had one in England. We, everyone used to try and fly this thing. But uh, they were beautiful little aeroplanes. Now, I mentioned Clem's because Itashagan was ahead of his time and he used to serve as tractors with these Clem's. And they had a, a flying, a model aeroplane competition down on Mungers Lake, down the bottom from us. And the fellow that won it received as a prize a ride in a Clem with Itashagan. And Itashagan, uh, the fellow that ran it was a fellow named David Reed. And uh, David had the luck of on this flight the engine stopped and the plane crash landed in the reeds at, at Mungus Lake. And Alec will remember that time because all the leadable larrikins were down there and my brother put me on his shoulders and we went out to look at this aircraft. Now, the, the only monoplane, only cabin Clem ever built was that one. And there are two things about it that are interesting. And the first one is that it's been found and it's been rebuilt and it's actually flying in, in Sydney today. And the other thing was that the fellow who won the prize, David Reed, went on and became a fighter pilot and lost his life in the European War. Some of you may have known him. Is there anyone here who knew him? No. Okay. Well, <coughs> before the war, my brother was a telephone technician, and so he became, uh, he went in the signals militia, and Alec, because he, of his Scottish background, and I'm told because he had a fine pair of legs and he didn't like wearing underwear, he joined the Highland Division. Is that, that's what I'm told. But when the war started, Sanity came back and he joined the Air Force. And you've heard he was in the first Empire Air Training Screen, screen Group, number one intake. And he was one of the first to get a commission. And we used to go on and say that he was first to get captain on Maltese and was shot down his first raid, but it's not true. He always corrects me, he gave the Hun quite a hiding for two or three flights before he got shot down. But uh, the terrible thing was that in our street we'd been a fairly lucky street. We had lots of people who were away at the war, the Max, the Len Palmer and the Hocking Boys and, and my brother and so on, but no one had been killed, no one had been hurt when we got the telegram that Alec was missing. And his mother, it was a terrible blow, uh, very soon afterwards, there was another telegram saying, missing, believe, dead. And the wait went on, and finally his mother became a recluse. And uh, it, she was, you know, she didn't give out the cookies anymore, you know, the 
biscuits to get rid of the kids, you know, you know what parents do. She became quite a recluse. And uh, I get emotional today when I remember one day there was a terrible noise out on the street. And I opened the door and looked out, and there was a Mrs. the reclusive Mrs. Kerr holding a telegram up and screaming out for as loud as she could, Alex alive, Alex alive, Alex alive. And he was, and he is, and we welcome him here today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your kind words of introduction. Uh, the genesis of uh, this talk, which I call Paths to Freedom and deals with the various escapes from uh, prison camps by Allied Airmen, uh, was uh, a phone call from uh, Les Gordon <coughs> some months ago who was uh, looking for a speaker for uh, V Day celebrations and he, in desperation, asked me if I would uh, uh, fill the gap and asked me to talk about Bomber Command. Well, I backed off because I couldn't guarantee, I could guarantee really that probably 100% of the audience uh, of Bomber Command uh, would have had greater experience in Bomber Command than I did. Uh, I was shot down early in 1941 on my fourth operation, uh, becoming the first pilot from the Empire Air Training Scheme uh, to be taken prisoner that way in World War II. But I can, uh, and so I couldn't really uh, see myself talking about Bomber Command, but I could talk about uh, aircrew prisoners of war experience, and so I suggested to Les uh, that I would share with them some of the ways in which uh, aircrew who had been taken prisoner attempted to find paths to freedom. Uh, I was, for a year or so, in Stalagluk Three, the camp from which uh, the Great Escape and the wooden hoofs uh, were launched. They occurred after I'd actually been sent away from Luft 3 to East Prussia to a, a cold place called Heidekrug on the Baltic coast. I could assume that uh, most of you are familiar with those much uh, publicised escapes, the, the Great Escape and the Wooden Horse, and also with the coldest uh, escapes uh, through their book and film exposures. So I won't touch on these at all. Uh, I am uh, circulating, uh, it's over here at the moment, a brochure which uh, commemorates the Great Escape Camp and you can see, uh, those of you who uh, look at it can see the great sophistication and detail of the, uh, of the tunnel that was built for the Great Escape. Much more sophisticated than uh, the one I escaped from which I'll deal with uh, a bit later on. Uh, many of you uh, will remember Captain Snook, who was a prominent flyer in the 20s and 30s here. Uh, do you remember the Clem monoplane, uh, the landings and takeoffs on the grass in Subiaco, the outings to the old Maylands aerodrome to see the constant weekend flying activities in the interwar period? Well, Captain Snook was part of all that. But what I didn't know about him, and learned only recently from uh, Brian Hernan, was that he flew in Europe in the First World War and was shot down and taken prisoner in 1916, well before the airman that I'm about to describe to you, who was the Australian Air Force's first successful escapee ever. As an interesting aside, <clears throat> which has nothing to do really with escaping, uh, but I'm sure would be of interest to some, I should mention how I met and shared a dungeon with Douglas Bader, the famous legless or tin-legged airman whose story was told in the film Reach for the Sky. After being discharged from a seven-month stay in hospital, I was processed at the German reception camp for Air Force prisoners of war uh, near Frankfurt on Main, and I was then dispatched to a regular prison camp just south of Berlin. On the way, however, I found myself in a dungeon-like prison in the bowels of an old castle at Mainz, just near Frankfurt. My two companions were Wing Commander Douglas Bader and a Polish squadron leader, whose name escapes me now. The dank granite walls in our forbidding dungeon glistened with water, and we guessed that, they, that we were beneath the River Rhine. It was very cold and wet, and the food was very basic to say the least. It was real prisoner of Zender stuff, 
We felt that all we needed to complete the picture was uh, some chains and perhaps an iron mask. Well, Bader was furious about this and he demanded some paper and a pen and he sat down to write to a Luftwaffe general who was one of the Luftwaffe pilots that he had met during the 30s when air forces uh, visited one another for flying pageants and before he lost his legs in a flying accident. And given the subsequent expansion of the Luftwaffe, most of the pilots that he met back in those late 20s and early 30s were now generals. Bada minced no words, and within three days we were free. Well, kind of, sort of. At least we could see the sky and breathe fresh air again. Bada and the Polish squadron leader went on their merry way to an officer's prison camp in Lubeck, and I found myself heading for a small prison camp at Kershain, just south of Berlin. I met up again with uh, Bader in Stalagluft III, and then once after the war, uh, when he visited Perth uh, on behalf of the Shell Oil Company. Well, on April the 30th, 1940, along with 39 other young would-be pilots, I walked through the gates of Summers Boys Camp on the outskirts of Melbourne. We were greeted by the trim figure of the Commandant, Squadron Leader T.W. White, DFC. Thomas Walter White was one of the first four men in Australia to be trained as a pilot in the Australian Flying Corps. He flew Morris Farman aeroplanes against the Arabs and Turks in the Middle East in the First World War. Here, in Mesopotamia, was the birth of the famous half flight uh, of four pilots and supporting personnel. This was the beginning of the Australian Flying Corps, which was attached to the Australian Army under the command of John Monash. You may wonder why I'm taking you back to the early days of the RAAF, or, or the AFC as it was first known. Well, a book was published in 1928 by Tommy White under the title of Guests of the Unspeakable, which contained uh, the exciting story of how Captain White and his observer Captain Yates Brown, were taken prisoner by a group of bloodthirsty Arabs and Turks after crashing on the outskirts of Baghdad, in the news all the time now, crashing into telegraph wires which they had flown across the desert to cut, to destroy. This misfortune occurs about one-tenth of the way into Tommy's book. The remainder deals with his incarceration in the hands of the Turks and his remarkable escape. His account of life uh, in a Turkish prison camp is remarkably similar to a corresponding picture that a prisoner in World War II would have painted. The record of his imprisonment, uh, from which the book Guests of the Unspeakable was written, uh, was contained in tiny booklets which he managed to keep hidden in the soles of his boots. His days as a prisoner ended and his adventures as an escapee began in 1918 when he escaped on the outskirts of the Turkish capital to which he'd been sent uh, as a prisoner for medical treatment uh, for uh, uh, an illness which he had feigned. The, tra the train in which he was travelling crashed into another one and in the ensuing melee he evaded the two guards who had been assigned to him. Then began a frantic chase through the streets of Constantinople with one of the guards hot on his heels. Being sl slightly fitter or, or, or at least faster anyhow than his pursuer, he began to outstrip him slowly until he had enough of a lead to be able to slip into the door of a house which fronted onto the street before the guard rounded the next corner. By amazing good luck, he had chosen the house of a Greek family who hated and despised the Turks. They sheltered him for a few hours, they gave him a fez and a nondescript Turkish coat and wished him luck as he ventured forth in the dusk onto the streets of Constantinople to try to keep a rendezvous that he had arranged some days before with another British officer should they make a successful escape. But several days of sipping coffee in restaurants near the designated rendezvous point uh, brought no fruit and he was coming anxious that his thin disguise would be seen through. Now Constantinople in the closing years of, uh, of the First World War was a web of intrigue with people of all nationalities mixing in a melange of suspicion and uh, inquiry. 
spies, secret police, counter spies, refugees from the Russian Revolution, escaped British and French soldiers mixing together in a variety of uniforms and civilian dress made for an atmosphere of danger and uncertainty in which no one could be trusted. So despite a good working knowledge of French, German, Russian and Turkish, which enabled him to parry unwelcome questions, Tommy White was beginning to get edgy. He was constantly on the move, avoiding personal contact and conversation wherever he could. He finally met up with a prearranged Russian contact who led him by a circuitous route to the Batum, a rusty old hulk due to sail for Odessa within a few days from then. On board he found Captain Bott, a fellow officer who had escaped at the same time as White. The Batum was to be their escape channel, but it took an inordinate time to take on board its designated cargo, and each day seemed like an eternity, for they were in hiding most of the time. After several weeks, secreted for most of the day in filthy, oily ballast tanks of the ship, which was still at anchor, and which was searched almost daily by the Turkish police, they got underway. The chief engineer was head of the syndicate which was to smuggle them to Russia, and he explained during the voyage that the crew had butchered all their senior officers during the revolution, and now sometimes they made mistakes of navigation. But it wasn't far to Odessa, and it would be difficult to get lost. Uh, three, days, uh, three nights later, they, to their relief, they saw the lights of Odessa. They made their landfall in Odessa at the end of September 1918, but soon realised the problem of leaving Russia was almost as difficult as that of reaching it. One had to escape the marauding bands of revolutionaries who killed everyone they came across, uh, and there were several British forces fighting in the vicinity, but there wasn't any easy, easy access to any of them. So after a month in Odessa, trying to find various ways to sneak out of the city, and contemplating joining the anti-Bolshevik volunteer army, which was to fight its way back to Russia, uh, they finally had the good fortune to hear of a hospital ship which was to take back released Ukrainian soldiers to Varna. After money passed hands, they were smuggled on board the night before a ship sailed, and three days later, they reported to Brigadier General Ross, who commanded the British garrison. Thus, after several months on the run, on the lookout all the time for the enemy in pursuit, living continually on his wits, and always conscious of the need not to make a mistake, the first member of the Australian Air Force ever to escape had found his freedom. If we now jump two decades to the Second World War, from the fledgling uh, air forces of 1918 to the large fleets of, tie, of uh, fighters and bombers of 1940s, we witness the far greater and more important overall role played by the air forces and the correspondingly greater number of air crew shot down and the increase in escapes which took place. This was in part, of course, due to the fact that uh, the number of heavy aircraft used in bomber command increased almost exponentially as the intensity of the bomber war gathered, and uh, the casualties mounted. Casualties in bomber command actually totaled 75,000 out of a force of 125,000 aircrew, so the number of prisoners taken was very high to start with. In part, it was also due to the fact uh, that uh, aircrew operating over enemy territory could expect to be taken prisoner, is shot down, and as a consequence, many of them were prepared in one way or another with escaping aids sewn in their tunics or boots, etc., to make attempts at escaping or evading. In part, it was also due to the fact a large number of aircrew were wanted to get back home and were prepared to risk getting shot in the attempt. The escapes themselves were, as might be imagined, quite varied from uh, single efforts to group breakouts, from outrageously stupid to highly skilled and cleverly planned, in most well-run camps of any size there was an escape committee which, along with the backing of the senior officers responsible for maintaining discipline, had the power to veto any plan submitted to it for any number of reasons. Obviously some scatterbrained escape plans could jeopardise others underway which were well thought out and which had a greater chance of success. <coughs> 
the ASOAP committees were also backed up by people ex of extraordinary skill and ingenuity who could produce high quality copies of official German documents, civilian clothes, German uniforms and equipment of one kind and another for escapes whose plans were approved by the escape committee. I was fortunate enough to have the chance to escape and also, I was also privy to plans submitted to the escape committee of two of the camps I was in. And I was also able to watch several escape attempts while they were actually being made. So I had some participation in the experience uh, of the planning, preparation and execution of escape attempts in the camps that I was in. Stalic 3E was a small camp which lay about 90 kilometres south of Berlin. It contained 185 aircrew prisoners of war housed in three small huts. <coughs> Unlike some of the other Allied aircrew camps, it was actually administered by the German army. It was in November 1941 when I walked through the gates of Stalic 3E, <coughs> having spent seven months in hospital in Schleswig-Holstein recovering from wounds that were sustained when I was shot down. <coughs> Planning got underway by Christmas 1941 to dig a tunnel leading north to an empty field across which an escape could be made. Five months later, after much laborious digging in the sandy soil, the tunnel was nearly complete, perhaps another 10 metres to go. In the almost black tunnel, lit here and there by small tins with pyjama cords soaked in margarine used as wicks, and shored up on the top and the side by bedboards to prevent collapses, the sweating Kriegis, as prisoners of war were known, the sweating Kriegis worked their ships in claustrophobic silence, gasping to get their share of the somewhat foul-smelling air filtering down through the three or four air holes that had been dug for ventilation. Cardboard boxes filled with sand dug out with food tins and passed down a line of crouching men through their legs in Red Cross parcels, provided the delivery system for the spoil, which was distributed surreptitiously around the outside compound. The longer the tunnel became, the worse the working conditions were. Everything was going reasonably well when crisis and consternation struck. In early May, we were informed that we would be shifted to another camp within a week. The chief tunnellers, Canadians Harry Calvert and Don Sugden, Suggy is still alive, he just called me about a week ago from Canada, were called upon for an accurate measurement. Was the tunnel now behind the wire, uh, be beyond the wire, or were we still in the confines of the camp? The answer came back, another two days would, in their opinion, see us there. We hoped their measurements were accurate. We were in luck. With the impending shift to another camp, it was really now or never. The decision was made, we would go. The would-be escapees, 50 out of 185, were silent that night, wrapped in their thoughts, and now facing the reality of risking their lives for freedom. I realised that by extreme coincidence, I would emerge from the tunnel exactly one year, almost to the minute, after I'd been shot down. Furious activity began among the would-be escapees, organising individual escape kits, drawing lots for places in the queue, writing letters to be hosted home, uh, to be posted home to friends, uh, if necessary, packing food which had been hoarded over previous weeks, and so on. And at 11:50 p.m., with charcoal blackened faces and hands, we began to enter the tunnel, making sure that our escaping gear which was hooked on here and there around the place, did not cause obstruction and that we made no noise as we crouched in the confines of that ever so small passage. <clears throat> Could never turn round, you always had to back out. Deathly silence and muffled voices came from up front. At one point there was a rumour that dogs were in the tunnel. Always rumours like that. Uh, we were, I'm sure, all keyed up, apprehensive, pulse racing, adrenaline pumping, waiting to get it over with. The tunnel was breached around midnight and Calvert and Sugden were the first out, followed by Jock Alexander, our camp leader. Thereafter, thereafter it was by ballot. I was number 11. As my head emerged 
into the fresh air, I took a greedy gulp and looked around. To my consternation and dismay, I discovered that we had just cleared the wire about, by about a metre, and the outside light from our hut was shining down on my head. This left us in the direct gaze of any guard who might look that way, and fortunately no one ever did. However, nothing for it but to begin my crawl, face down towards the trees some hundred metres from the breakout point, with the, with the possibility of a bullet in the back of the head any moment, time seemed to go awfully slowly. It seemed as though it took me several hours to make those trees. I don't think I've ever been so scared. My mouth was so drained of saliva that I couldn't talk for some time afterwards. Anyhow, we made our rendezvous, Chappie and Wingy and me, and we were soon off into the night. Our plan for several reasons was to travel at night and hide up in the daytime. We were at loose for 10 exciting and eventful days, stealing food, jumping trains at night while we headed south. We were the 48th to be caught, and when finally we were taken back to camp, we were surprised to find that the German Army Administration had been withdrawn, and it was under the complete control of the Gestapo. The menacing black uniforms did nothing to relieve our apprehension as to what might happen to us. Our 10 days of freedom were packed full of exciting moments and adrenaline rushes, as you may well imagine. But all of that is another story, uh, and I won't deal with that today. But one rather amusing incident may be mentioned briefly. On about the third day out, we'd travelled uh, on foot all night, and around dawn we came to a large stretch of sand, a large expanse of sand. It was pretty desolate, apart from a clump of bushes that were judged to be the centre of this large sandy plain. We decided to hole up for the day under cover of the bushes and dug ourselves into the sand as best we could. After a few squares of chocolate and some dry bread and water, we fell asleep. Late morning, we were rudely awakened by nearby explosions and to our horror, it dawned upon us that we'd camped in the centre of a Luftwaffe bombing range. <laughs> and we were, now, we were now on the receiving end uh, rather than the dishing out end. Uh, fortunately, the bombs appeared to be small practice bombs, and although some of them landed uncomfortably close, we suffered nothing more than a good fright. But no sooner had the bombing stopped than our collective sigh of relief was cut short by the sight of a group of Luftwaffe officers striding towards our clump of bushes. They had obviously come to inspect the results of the bombing practice, and they spent about half an hour or so, not more than 10, min uh, 10 metres, from where we were desperately trying to pretend we didn't exist. It was a tight situation, but they finally walked off, and we vowed that in future we would give large sandy patches a good berth. <laughs> the extent of the breakout, and, I, I, and I'm circulating, incidentally, some uh, criminal posters that were posted throughout Germany in all police stations which carried the names and the descriptions of all of us. Uh, the, it's a, quite a historical document. The extent of the breakout and the consternation it caused within the military hierarchy and the civil reactions it led to had made frontline news in Germany. The police stations throughout Germany had on their walls wanted posters giving particulars of the escaped airmen. The skies seemed filled with light aircraft which had been taken off other duties to search for us. We were all recaptured within 10 days. We had scored a few records unwittingly, in our labours to seek a path to freedom. The total of 52 men made it the largest breakout to that date. Of the 52, all were recaptured, but Calvert was shot dead upon recapture. The length of the tunnel was 42 metres, making it longer than any tunnel in World War I and the longest so far in World War II. Great escape tunnel beat that. And the only, it was the only tunnel from which all who intended actually got away. Our new, found frame, uh, our new found fame had preceded us and when we got to our new camp, Stalagorf III, the chief escape officer in the office compound sent a message of congratulations to us. The new camp was Luft III, from which the great escape took place three years later and from which many interesting escapes took place in the interim. I managed two more escapes, the last one of which was successful, so in fact I did, I celebrated the end of the war, VE Day, 
by dancing in the streets of Brighton. I have one or two single escapes which are of interest, but at the moment we'll continue with one more mass escape, an interesting one involving a Perth man who I hoped might have been here today, Bob Jones, but is unable to because of his illness. Uh, it was illustrated of the many escapes which were made across the border from Italy into Switzerland and also from France, from Holland and France down into Spain. Flying officer Bob Jones, flying Kitty Hawks with three squadron RWF in the Middle East, was shot down in January the 11th, 1942. He crash landed in sand dunes and after several days during which he evaded capture by travelling at night and holding up during the days, he was taken prisoner by a group of frontline Italian troops. He was soon handed over to the Germans who were moving 700 POW officers from Italy to Germany and Jones found himself in one of only three wooden boxcars in this total train. All the rest were metal. The wooden one was a handy one to escape from. This was part of an overall strategy of the German High Command who, as the fortunes of war were turning against them, were beginning to think of the possibility of negotiating value of a large number of prisoners. Uh, more than half a million at that point the Germans were holding and possible tactical placement of prisoners alongside uh, military targets. Jones found himself in a boxcar with 29 other prisoners uh, on his way to Germany and efforts were soon underway to try to make an escape and the wooden surrounds of the door lock were slowly gouged out by an officer using a knife. Of the 30 prisoners in the, in the boxcar, only 12 wanted to go. Lots were drawn from the jump to jump from the moving train and uh, Jones drew number three. On the second night uh, in this boxcar, uh, about 3 a.m., when the train lost speed on an uphill slope, he made his jump. He hit the ground and rolled in towards the rails in order to escape being seen by German soldiers crouched uh, on occasional flat top cars armed with machine guns. Only nine escaped successfully before the Germans began shooting. After the train had passed and with the sense of machine and with the noise of machine gun fire in the distance, he set off on foot to put as much distance between him and the enemy as possible. On the way, he met up with other escapees and they came across two peasants who gave them some civilian clothes and pointed them to the river Ardige, which they would have to cross to get to Switzerland and to freedom. With the assistance of an Italian lady and her two children, they walked hand in hand across the bridge, which spans the Ardige and which was guarded at each end by German soldiers. Safely beyond the bridge, they thanked the lady who had risked their, her life to help them and continued on their way upwards, beginning the long climb to the border which was their immediate target. When, after a long, hard climb up a narrow mountain track for some hours, they found a friendly farmer who put them up in his barn, they discovered that they were in the Dolomites, near the Austrian border. Next morning, they continued their climb, crossing the Brentner Pass at about 9,000 feet. At this point, they came across five other SKPs from the train <coughs> uh, that they had travelled in. They remained together for a little more than a day before they decided that as a party of eight they were more likely to attract attention than ones or twos. So Bob Jones joined forces with two others and together they made their independent way along the unfriendly track. They plodded up on the narrow pass which was getting harder and colder. Sometimes it took them down into valleys before turning up again towards the next peak. In the evening they came across a chalet, empty except for the caretaker who gave them shelter for the night but who had no food or to spare. Next morning, he directed them to the track to Switzerland. They pushed upward once more, with the track becoming much steeper, skirting villages and in others receiving hasty but well-intentioned and much appreciated hospitality in the form of bread and hot coffee. In the later afternoon, they crossed Maro Caro at 13,000 feet. They were confronted by a glacier which then had to be crossed. They had been warned of the dangers of the crevices which in bad weather were covered by snow, but they traversed them safely. The glacier itself was about half a mile in width and took about two hours to traverse. The escapees were beginning to realise how much colder it would get before they could rely on Swiss hospitality to bring them back 
to normality. They realised also that without enough food to provide the calories their bodies needed, they could find themselves in dire straits. This became more obvious as they climbed higher day by day, energy ebbing and extremities becoming colder. A young Italian ex-army lad named Foroni joined the group at one stage and he told the three escapees that the mountains they could see in the distance marked the Swiss border, but that they were very difficult and dangerous to cross at that point without knowing the lay of the land. The weather was changing rapidly, it was becoming cold and it was obvious to the escapees that they would have to proceed with haste if they were to beat the weather into Switzerland. They needed someone to guide them. Ferroni introduced them to two mountaineers who offered to guide them to the border for an appropriate money settlement. So uh, they sold their watches in a village for cash and uh, raised enough to pay the gold and prepared to face the treacherous track to freedom. Jones prepared for what would be, he hoped, their final ordeal by donning a much used corn sack out of which had been cut two armholes to serve as some kind of protection from the biting cold. They got underway at about 3 a.m., the two smugglers uh, leading, traversing slippery slopes and sometimes losing sight of the track itself. Snow was falling as they crossed the border in Switzerland and Bob's left side was giving him a lot of pain. And in fact, it's a strange disease that he got from that experience that has kept him away from being here today. Uh, entering a log hut used by Swiss border guards, they lit a fire and Bob's companions massaged his legs, his side and his arms to restore circulation. Partially thawed out and eager to push on, they left the hut and shortly encountered a patrol of Swiss soldiers. With heavy rain falling, they were soaked and bitterly cold once more. But it was not long before they were escorted to a hotel in the next village where a hot bath, a warm room, a large glass of brandy and fresh clothes led finally to the realisation that they were free again. Thus, they had escaped successfully from Italy into Switzerland. The story was matched often by groups of evaders who worked, they say, who worked their way south to Spain for as far north as the Netherlands along the famous comet line of safe houses owned by incredibly brave Dutch and French civilians who daily risked being discovered by the Gestapo and tortured to death. Many escapees were saved and many brave patriots were murdered by the Gestapo. Well, in conclusion, let's now venture into Stalag Book 3, <coughs> from which, as I mentioned, uh, the great escape was made and where the wooden horse was created. Two experienced and inventive escapers had already made a name for themselves by the time I arrived there after having been recaptured at Stalag 3E. They were Morris and Grimson. I just have time to mention two of their many escapes. On one occasion we put a concert on in the hall and invited the camp commandant and his senior officers to come as guests. When the concert was about halfway through, two of the German officers left the building and went back to the gate on their way to other duties. As it happens, the guard on the gate was at the end of his beat, some 30 metres actually from the gate. This infuriated the officers who called him back, gave him a good dressing down for not being on his post and stormed through, headed for their quarters. When the concert ended, the commandant in his retinue thanked the prisoners and made their way back to their billets. The guard found that he had two too many officers and wanted to arrest the last two. When it was finally all sorted out, after, after much shouting and argument, I was watching all this, uh, the security officer concluded that two officers who went through the gate at half time were interlopers. He was Morrison Grimson, of course. <laughs> Dressed in camp-made officers' uniforms and speaking near-perfect German, as they did, they had little trouble in terrifying the guard who, after the roasting they gave him for being away from his post, let them through without asking to see their passes. Uh, as it happens, their passes were near perfect too. Uh, they left the camp, made their way to the railway station where they intended to, to take a train to the south. Unfortunately for Morris and Grimson, a German officer from the camp was on the platform and he recognised them immediately because they already had 
a reputation for escaping. The next escape, and the last one, I would like to describe is a one-man job, and it involves Grimson. Uh, it was his last escape, and it was a successful one. Around lunchtime one day, a German soldier in working overalls, goon suits we used to call them, uh, stepped over the warning wire and propped his ladder against the electrified wire fence surrounding the camp. He climbed up the ladder and spoke to the armed guard. He, he, he was just near a guard post uh, in the guard box, explaining to him that he was about to test the electricity in the wire. He produced a black wooden box about that size, which had a handle protruding, uh, and uh, uh, two electric alligator leads to which there were two earphones, uh, uh, and also two earphones. He clipped the red lead to one wire and the black lead uh, to the other wire, put the earphones to his ears, and then turned the handle several revolutions. He muttered a few words to the guard, then climbed down the ladder and walked to the next guard box and repeated the same procedure. At that point, he told the second guard he's going to stop for lunch. And he couldn't be, since he couldn't be bothered going right back to the gate, he'd just swing his ladder over to the outside yeah. and climb down from there. Uh, he did this, telling the guard to keep an eye on the ladder uh, until he returned and make sure, make sure that no other worker took it. And, no, and off he went to lunch. It, it was, of course, Grimson. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, there's not a happy ending to this successful and imaginative escape. Grimson ended up working with the Polish underground after some unbelievable adventures on the way, and I have a book that describes those. On one occasion, he actually assisted a German officer to organise a working party to load a cargo ship heading for Sweden, but he declined to make his escape on that ship. He went back to work with the Polish underground. Eventually, in 1944, the Gestapo captured him and executed him after torture. Well, that's all I have time for, and I know, I'm sure I've run over my time. Many, many tunnels were built by hopeful prisoners during the war, but only seven were successful. Nearly 200 men escaped out of them, but of these, only eight managed to make it back to England. A pitifully small success figure, but it wasn't the want of trying to find paths to freedom.